Oh, I have some viewers. Okay, <laughs> I I have three viewers, in fact. So, I don't have very long today. So, what I was thinking of doing is... Oh no, I've got two viewers. Uh, so, I, I was thinking that we would just discuss some small things. I don't really have time to do any programming. Um, and I also had an idea that we would do something that's, that's not even programming and basically unrelated to sapling, uh, which is to uh, make a, a banner for my YouTube channel because it still has the same banner that it's had. Um, the banner is the bit behind my logo. Uh, it's got the same banner that it has has had for <laughs> since it started. Um, and I, I also realized that no one... I, no one knows when I'm going to stream, right? Because you can go to my YouTube channel and there's just no mention at all that streams happen at 2 p.m. on Saturday uh, or 7 p.m. if you're in the UK. Um, so I was going to make, you know, in in Photoshop or Gimp, the open source version, uh, I was going to make a, a new version of that to, to keep in in keeping with my, uh, my other logo. Uh, I'm trying to find my channel in YouTube, which is proving hard. Uh, oh, can I get all this? Oh, oh, of course, and it chooses the wrong Firefox window. Well done. Here we go. Right. Okay, so. So you can see it just says Neasel at the back, which is, you know, like it's cool, but it's out of keeping with uh, the new logo that I made. And so I was going to change that. But before we get into that, um, I actually, <laughs> I managed to finish the stuff from last week, the implementing counts, uh, which turned out to be, uh, that was an insane project. Like there, there was no way that was going to fit in a stream. I, that was incredibly optimistic to say the least but i i've basically done it there are a few things to i i, I just want to show it on stream because uh, it's kind of cool and it took me most of the week uh cargo run right so now uh like sapling does the same as it always did the this is a bit broken i have yet to fix that i'll fix that in another uh, another pull request uh but essentially everything is working now you can uh, uh everything that did work is working again so you can say i, I don't know insert true as a child uh, that works uh but now you can say you can insert other thing you can insert more than one thing at a time so uh you, you could say oh ins oh for insert three true and then three trues will appear. Uh, all as one action as well. If we undo, that's one action. Which, which is, like, <laughs> that that's surprisingly difficult to achieve. Uh, also, replacement works the same way. So, say, replace with three string also works. Uh, and that... Uh, yeah, it, it works. It works fine with the values that you things that you can't expand uh, so uh, children of a field you can't have more than one child so replacing this with two strings is not allowed but replacing it with one string is fine uh, so stuff like that is working the only thing that i didn't implement oh, oh so there's another thing you can put counts in front of commands so say you've got insert that uh, is so insert next to null say uh, you can also do three insert null and it will have the same effect because it's it's running the command i n three times in a row uh and you can even you can even combine them so you can say three i two n and it will insert six which is perhaps a duplication of, of features perhaps we don't need it to work like that but for but I, I found inserting three trues to be a much more intuitive at least from english 
uh, in a much more intuitive way of thinking about that. And for stuff like undo, oh, we don't have anything to undo. Do we have stuff to redo? Okay, let's make some stuff to undo. Uh, you can do the same to any command. So, for example, you wanted to undo three steps, you can do three u, and it will do all three undos at the same time. And the, the only thing that I'm slightly unhappy about was the implementation of uh, inserting as a child. So if you were to say uh, insert three arrays, uh, then that's fine. You get three arrays. But what should happen if you were to say twi like twice insert as a child three arrays? Um, at the moment, it assumes that you want to do both insertions at the same time. But the thing is, th there's a kind of in intuitive thing to make, make things consistent with itself, is that if you had a command that you put a count in front of, say, 3u, uh, to th undo three times, uh, it's kind of intuitive that that would be the same as pressing u three times. So u, u, u. Uh, would be the same as undoing three times. So three u is the same as u u u. Uh, that that kind of makes sense, I think. Um, but the thing is that uh, inserting three true, uh, sorry, uh, inserting as a child three arrays, and then inserting three arrays again, do, doing that multiple times. That this is not the same as what currently happens if you just say two o three a. And like pretty much, I, I was thinking, oh yeah, well, obviously the right thing to do would be to to do what we had before, which is o three a o three a something like this. But I couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't see a reason why people would want to do this in practice because it only works on nodes that you're allowed to insert into themselves, and I figured that that wouldn't be very common. Uh, like in a lot of languages, I guess you have expressions. So an, an expression, you can put an expression inside an expression, say with like plus, plus combines two expressions into a bigger expression. Um, I don't know. It turned out that this was just way easier to implement, which is why I did it this way. <laughs> Laziness always wins uh, in one programming. But there is there is another another part to this, which is that the implementation of getting this to work under the current system is very janky. And I'll see if I can, can I find something to, to illustrate this? Uh, so this is the file that we have all of the editing code in. Uh, let's look at replace, because this is the, the main, the, the, the uh, what's the word? the main offender of janky code. Uh, and, and the issue is, it's just got, uh, the, the main issue that's causing this is that there are kind of two ways uh, you can handle the fact that you only ever want when someone's editing code with saplings. Since you're editing a syntax tree, you're kind of forced, you, you have to enforce the fact that the tree always has to be valid. Like, we shouldn't be able to do things like, oh, Vim, what are you doing? Um, you shouldn't be able to do something like going to a field and replacing it with false, uh, which is currently possible. And that's kind of a bug because this is this is just not valid JSON, right? Um, you can't have false directly within an object. You can have it as a field, sure. Um, we could replace this with false. That would work. Uh, that's fine. But not here that, that this is not okay and at the moment that we try and do as much of that checking at compile time uh, because i thought you know compile time checks are, are generally better than runtime checks that's fairly well known at least in the systems programming languages you want to do as much in the compiler as possible like type checking is is way more safe than doing it at runtime because if your code doesn't run, if your code has mistakes and doesn't run, then it doesn't matter um, because you can fix all the mistakes and then run it and then you know everything's fine. And we had the same thing going on with 
how nodes were stored. So for example, true can have no children. Like you, you shouldn't be able to insert a node into true. That, that doesn't make any sense. And likewise, a field can have max two children. Uh, that, right, so it, it, max and min two children. It has to have exactly one, uh, two children, a, a key and a value. And I, I figured, you know, Rust has uh, 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 algebraic data types. This is an algebraic data type. Why not represent it like that? And so I did. And we end up with the JSON type here. This is a, uh, what, what JSON looks like. And all, all of our constants are simply constants, like JSON true. That there's no way you could put a child into true because the, the compiler wouldn't let you. It wouldn't compile code that's allowed to do that. And then an array it has just a vector of pointers to its children. Uh, there's a whole load of jankiness with the, the arena. But that's just saying all of the nodes are stored in one place in memory, which is called an arena. Uh, it, well, it's the arena in the case of sapling. But it means that they all have the same lifetime and we can guarantee that the pointers are okay. Um, Rust memory type checking, borrow checker things. Um, and the same with object. Object has a vector of children. And w one thing we can't enforce even in this setup is that these JSONs actually have to be fields because in the representation that Sapling uses, a an object directly contains the fields. So if we alternate between child and parent here, the, the object contains fields, which contains the keys and values. And I'm, I've no idea if that's, that's the best way of doing it. We can change it at any point, but for the time being, that was, that was how you, if you were writing a parser for JSON, that was, that would be how I would represent it. Um, and then we have field, which jankily has to, have an array in here uh, it has to have a thing of length two which is a little bit janky but it's basically saying oh yeah the first one of these is the field and this has to be a string we can't check that at compile time because it, we can't re we can't reference just the string type that, that's not possible so we just represent the type and say oh it's a pointer to json and rem reminder at runtime check that it's a string and then finally we have string. And obviously there, there are there more parts to JSON? Uh, there are number literals, so we don't have them yet. But for the time being, this is, this is all we've got. Uh, so, but the thing is, this makes the replace code really janky because one thing we notice is that we couldn't delete anything out of a field, e even if we wanted to, and we're going to replace it immediately. That's not possible. Uh, fields are, they're, they're just a slice of length two. There's a pointer and another pointer, and those are stored in the memory structure. You can't take one of them out. Uh, and I, I didn't think this was a problem to start with, but it turns out it is a problem because, okay, it's not a problem. It just makes life unnecessarily difficult. And I, it just, in my experience of writing not great code, stuff that makes your life difficult, generally speaking, turns into problems. Um, so uh, where are we looking for? Editor DAG. And we can see in here that this is in the, in the, the offensive code. Hold on. OBS, what are you doing? Right, there we go. Okay, well. Well, that's annoying. Wait, so does that mean that no one has seen anything I do on the, the right-hand screen? Uh, have I just been... <laughs> have I just been demonstrating absolute nothingness the whole time? Well, n no comments, but I guess I have. Um, I must have been. Uh, oh, well, that was, a, that was a bit of a waste of 10 minutes. But, oh, well, we were all. So pretty much what I was saying was that 
we currently have a load of constraints about JSON like built into the types uh, and the, the type of the JSON uh, the, 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 the JSON Yes, I, I I will blame OBS. Um, I, I think OBS definitely is at fault here. It did this. It did this in the first live stream. Oh, in fact, that's another thing. Uh, another thing I want to just run past you people watching is I'm currently numbering the streams, and like I, I think this is cool generally to to number the live streams because it's like you know we can have milestones like this is the tenth stream. Yeah, that's not a huge achievement but you know it is an, a, a milestone but the thing is that the first live stream was very bad and it was my first live stream i don't mind i don't begrudge that but uh i i don't really want the first thing that people see of my channel to be that and uh for opening Uh, yeah, so Finn E says that for opening a syntactically incorrect node, you could have like an unsafe thing, like from Rust. And that, that, that's exactly what I plan to do, uh, which is uh, not quite an unsafe node, but to have a, a kind of error. So it's error with some text. And it's like, hey, this is the text. I know, We know what type it's supposed to be. Like if it's, uh, if the error is here, for example, we know oh, well, this is going to be a field. We know what it's going to be, but for some reason it's not. And so it's an error. And then what I was planning on doing is to have some kind of edit text uh, mode where you you would select something. So you would, you could even select the entire document, right? And then you could press something, I don't know, like T for text. And then it would put you into a buffer where you could edit that syntax tree node. So if I selected this and wanted to turn it, I, I I don't know, for some reason I wanted to turn it into an array, but I, I couldn't be bothered to replace it with an array. Um, I could say, oh yeah, here, T, which is not defined yet. And then it would open up a little thing where I could type text. And then once I was happy with that, I could press return, uh, whatever, like to say, oh yeah, I'm happy with this. And then it would reparse that thing. So in the case of, let's say I, replaced it with a uh, open cut bracket curly bracket and that's a an object it was like this except that i did that with text like by typing as you'll just have to imagine it for now uh so uh, imagine i did that and now it would go oh yeah well i'm expecting some root json object here and you've just given me some text that's in this position in the tree and so i'm just going to parse it and this string that you've given me is valid it parses an empty array, and so it re replaces the node. And it kind of does a replace, except that you typed text. Um, so you could replace with a, a huge JSON tree if you wanted. Like you could go into text mode, paste a whole load of JSON, and then it would just get reparsed as part of the tree. Um, and because I thought, you know, some languages, like increasingly, languages want to be as flexible as possible with their grammar, like. Uh, Rust, you can put expressions and blocks and you can like interchange them. And I figured, you know, sometimes it will be a pain to write every little thing as syntax trees. Like, let's say I just wanted to say X plus one. That's, it would almost certainly be faster to go into text mode and say X plus one than to go, oh yeah, well, uh, select the plus, like select this place, replace it with plus, then insert x on one side and one on the other like there's a lot of there's a lot of movements and i figured that at that point you might as well just kind of jump through the safety hatch of oh yeah uh, we can just edit this as text and then when i press escape or whatever to get back out into the syntax tree node it would just reparse that and just go back to the tree as it was uh, but that's that means i have to implement parsing and I, I do not feel ready to do that. I like it, it's something that obviously has to happen. Uh, a text editor that can't open anything is pointless, uh, as far as any kind of use is concerned. But it is just so. 
it's kind of hard to to figure out oh what's the best way of parsing arbitrary text um, so that that's what i was basically planning to do and it's quite nice because uh all that you would have is you'd have um for every for every type of data you would have a load of functions that's like hey parse generic json and then parse a key value pair and parse a string and stuff like that and then if you have this like edit text mode then when you press escape to exit out of that it reparses a section of the tree but what do you know the root is a section of the tree so we can use the same function to parse the entire document and that, that's what i was thinking you could use the same set of functions it doesn't matter if it's just opening a file all you're doing is you could imagine that as oh yeah we started with a blank file we went into text mode and we added the entire document that we we're opening, right? And then we want this as a syntax tree, so we parse the entire thing. And then we get it as a syntax tree and we select the root. That was my my thinkings. Um, and what we'd probably want is some kind of, we'd need a special case for the error where you don't have anything, uh, which is called a hole uh, in a lot of, uh, uh, what are they called? Procedural and structural editors. There we go. They should be an umbrella term. Syntax tree editors. We can call them that. Uh, well, that was a, a long digression. But that's what streams are all about. Stream, streams are all about the digressions. Um, what was I even talking about? It was compile time stuff, I think. On the basis that we got something open. Because this is another thing. That the AST json structure this is how json is represented um it in the com like in the compiler it enforces a load of stuff uh, and this in itself is incompatible with the kind of error correction stuff uh, because it enforces like, th there's no error here H how would we do that um and in reality you'd want you'd want every every data type to have an error and the error has to be handled separately. It, it is a special case. And th this is not really possible. The other thing that's that's interesting is this section here, which is that the field structure always has to have two children. It has to have a key on the left-hand side and a value on the right-hand side. That's always going to have to be the case. But sometimes it's a lot easier if you can just break the tree temporarily. So for example, replacing the left-hand side of a tree with a string, that should be okay. Um, and ideally, I'd, it would be really nice to be able to implement replace as a deletion followed by an insert. So you just like delete the cursor and insert back in the place. Um, and in all bar this case, everything except fields, it's possible to do that. But you can't rely on this. Like, one one place where it's not possible is as bad as it not being possible everywhere. Uh, so I, I was trying to look for a way, how could we be able to break the trees at runtime so that we can like break and fix them again? Uh, and that's what I was going to do after implementing counts because the code for counts has a lot of special cases for um, if you're doing a replace then the first the first thing you replace you you can't do a deletion then an insertion because a deletion might break things um, and in fact there's no way to delete children out of a, a json value and so the first thing is let's say i uh oh jeeps okay i do love it when <laughs> sapling has different keyboard shortcuts to vim so if i start typing in vim by accident it just goes haywire uh, so let's say I was here and I inserted, or I replaced with three nulls, say. Uh, we're going from one one value to having three. So we've increased the size of the parent, which is this array, uh, by two. And the thing is, what I'd ideally like to do is to say, oh, well, this is the same as deleting the cursor and then inserting three well, it's inserting three nulls. Okay, the, these two, they, they should be the same. And the thing is, if you, 
uh, at the moment we have two different ways of doing it like you've got the code that inserts and the code that deletes and we've got code that replaces and they're all different they're not relying on each other and th that's okay right like you could get away with that but more than anything it's just a liability right like those three pieces of code have to be kept in sync and ideally replace would literally just be delete and insert uh, it would be two function calls the entire function would just be two function calls would be like delete the cursor and insert uh, except make sure that you don't save the state in between uh, and then at the end at the end of every every time you change the file you check the validity of the tree so uh, you can do this cheaply as well because you only changed a small fraction so you only have to recalculate the validity of that small section of the tree uh, and this is what I was thinking is you could just, you could have everything checked at runtime, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Like, because I would prefer to have everything checked at compile time, uh, except we can't. And some things are just considerably less elegant, the more special cases you have. Because um, let, let's say you did do the way of getting, like, you got more to check at compile time. So we'd like the left-hand side of fields to always be strings. So ideally we'd have field be, say, type field. I actually, this is struct and field. And it has a key, which is some string type or JSON string, we could say. And then the right-hand side value is just a generic JSON. And we could do it like this, and then our tree would turn into a whole ton of structures like this. We'd have field, uh, and then we'd have we'd have string, uh, struct, str is well, oh well, it's just got a string inside it, uh, and so on. And we could just have loads of these, and. The, the thing is, this is okay. I, I would be fairly happy with this, but then how do you do replace? Like each of these has got to implement their own replace, uh, which is like, I think th this seems like it would be better, but I have a strong suspicion that it wouldn't be. I think this would be worse than just having everything checked at runtime. Because I reckon invariably you're going to have stuff checked at runtime. Like, d does anyone, I, ha have I missed anything? obvious there that's the kind of thing does anyone uh, does anyone have like it oh, sorry if anyone has stuff to say like and questions and things that i think you think are, are wrong or weird then just say um anyway i won't do this on stream because it would it would take a heck of a long time i might do it next stream i'd probably want to get some code done earlier than that but that that was something to discuss. What else are we going to do? I know we're going to do some just have some chilled not coding time making a, a banner. I mean, like, does anyone want to, does anyone specifically want to see coding? I think <laughs> we've got uh, a lot of people right now and I feel like everyone's here for the coding. Right, I'm, let's switch, oh, OBS, oh, oh, my word, it actually worked. Uh, okay, so what I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, so by yes, is yes, yes for, uh, you, you're here for coding, or you're, you're, you want to see me make a, a banner for my YouTube channel. Because um, basically I'll, I'll do, whichever one I don't do now, I'll do after stream or after dinner for me. Because we could just get our hands dirty and do some code. But I figured that uh, actually live streaming is more suited to like discussion or just doing something visual than it is to just like grunt work coding. Um, that, that, that was my thinking.
<laughs> okay. No, so no rep- I'll keep doing this until I get a reply. How about that? Uh, so. Oh, what what's? How much have I finished of the uh, of the banner? I I've done nothing. So it, it would just be uh, doing it basically from scratch. I have my. I was going to crib off my logo as well. Um, the kind of the uh, the rainbow pattern in the background. I was going to use that. Oh, of, of the code editor. Um, well, the code editor is not very... Um, I, I haven't done a lot. It hasn't been around for very long. That's the thing. And I've had exams most of the time. Well, it, well like, it's, it's been term time. Uh, but pretty much the, it's kind of an experiment. I don't want to... Um, I basically want to figure out as soon as possible whether or not it's going to actually be useful right because sapling is an experiment like it's not like i'm re-implementing something that exists like I, I i'm pretty sure no one has tried to take the stuff ideas from vim and apply it to syntax trees in a way that's general to all languages uh, that that seems to be new unless i've missed something but so the, the thing is i have no idea if this is useful like it could just be that this is, uh, this is just significantly more difficult for a user to use. That's the thing. Um, so I wanted to figure out as early as possible whether or not that would be useful. And so, ah, uh, okay. So tree sitter is similar. Um, I I've looked at tree sitter and tree sitter does similar things. Um, tr so for those who don't know, tree sitter is a. Uh, oh, in fact, I can probably find what it does. So tree sit is basically a generic parsing tool. Um, pretty much the, the problem that it's trying to solve is uh, that text editors have to do syntax highlighting or they should do syntax highlighting. And the problem is that doing syntax highlighting well is very, very hard. Uh, and it, it's generally an unsolved problem because you've got you, you've got two constraints. You need it to be fast because you could open a very big file and are making changes to it all the time. And the syntax highlighting has to kind of update. Otherwise, everything would break. Um, and it has to be a reasonable degree of accurate, right? Like, there's no point highlighting things randomly. You've got to have some kind of knowledge of the underlying language. And a lot of editors do very badly. Vim is, is one of them. Because the state of the art for a long time was to use a lot of like uh, regular expressions and say, oh, let's say I open some Rust code. Well, if you see the string use as a word, then that's, uh, oh, you can't see that. Okay, here's the Rust code. And we see use is a different color to say cray. And that's because it's, it's passed a, a search over the entire document. It's basically doing repeated search. It says, oh yeah, look for use or enum or impl or that kind of thing. And then highlight them, in this case, yellow, which is uh, the, the color of this is a keyword. And this is okay. Uh, people have got very good at making this strategy work. The advantage is it's fast because you have to run a load of regexes over the document. And regex is that they've been around for enough time that people have got them very, very fast. Um, but the thing is, this this breaks down considerably. Uh, I can't remember. I think I was I was editing Haskell, and uh, one time for for uni, and the syntax highlighting just co went completely haywire. It couldn't handle like multi line comments or something like that. And the real issue is that syntax highlighting, like regex syntax highlighting. It has no idea about the underlying structure uh, of your code. It's just like pretending to be slightly smart about how syntax highlighting works. And someone at GitHub, uh, worked for GitHub, was like, hold on, we're, we're building a text editor. GitHub is building Atom at the time. And, you know, like, it's surely not that difficult to parse the document, then use the syntax tree that you get from parsing it to do syntax highlighting. And that's what TreeSitter does. It's a parsing tool that 
you give it a specification of a language and it can parse stuff but moreover it can it can do what's called incremental parsing so let's say i was editing some text and i started typing in here uh there's no point parsing this whole bit of the code right 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 down to the end there's just no point it won't change because we've only typed up here and so what tree sitter does is it if i were to start typing here it would kind of like it would update the bit around my text and then if that is now like needs some reparsing further up then it would reparse and it would bubble out and and tree sitter is pretty fast um it, it's like impressively fast for that and it can keep up with keystrokes and the advantage is is that tree sitter's syntax highlighting is perfect well it's as perfect as the grammars it uses for the language and in most cases those have got pretty good so tree sitter is really excellent for that but it has a few issues that make it not useful for sapling um don't get me wrong like i'm i'm not saying we should reinvent the wheel i definitely think we should like sapling needs to be able to handle tree sitter grammars because they're just like a resource right someone's put the effort to make grammars in a standard language for tons and tons of programming languages so we may as well use them but tree sitter itself uh, only really supports one workflow it's that you have a buffer of text you change the buffer of text and then you change the syntax tree and all the syntax tree is really for um is it's basically saying which spans of text belong to which section um it can do more than syntax highlighting but all it fundamentally does is say oh yeah this is like say this region is a type definition uh this is a an enum section and like this is a uh, what is it literal uh and that's all tree sitter does it just runs through the document and assigns all of the bits of the syntax tree to regions in the document but it has a few issues which is it completely ignores comments because you know you can do comment highlighting with a regex that's okay but for the syntax tree it doesn't matter where the comments are Co comments are not part of a syntax tree usually and so the comments just disappear as far as tree sitter is concerned and sapling you might want to edit a comment so you know that's not possible uh, the other thing tree sitter can't do that sapling needs is it can't go backwards you can't go from directly editing the syntax tree back into text which is needed right because you want to edit the syntax tree that's the whole point and let's say i save the file like you need it to be back at text to go to disk uh, so you have to be able to go backwards you have to be able to deparse in, in a way deparse the the edited syntax tree and i don't think tree sitter can do that uh, i might be wrong but i'm pretty sure it it kind of treats the rendered like the parsed syntax trees are immutable i'm pretty sure of this uh, and it has a few other issues like it makes very makes very heavily nested trees as well because it uses a lot of left recursion which i'd quite like to avoid but um i i kind of quail at the thought of writing a generic parser i I'll, I'll probably just hack one for json or something like that uh just so it sapling can open and close files but the the point is that it that like the, the quality of the grammars and the quality of the parsing doesn't really determine it, it's not conducive to the experiment that we're trying to do at the moment which is would a text editor like this actually be useful to use because if it isn't it doesn't matter how good the grammars are like it doesn't matter how good the parsing and deparsing and all of that stuff works that doesn't matter if the whole thing is useless so uh that's why i haven't implemented it yet it's it's obviously a fairly fundamental thing to do um but i haven't done it yet uh, also stuff like copy and paste is not implemented but uh, it's got all of the the really fundamental features you can you can do all of the operations you can insert Oh, wait, it's insert as child. True. You can delete with X. And you can do replacement. So replace string. And like a load of stuff works. Like you can insert, let's say I insert a string into a, a an object. Then it conveniently, rec rec make, like it makes a field for us, basically. Uh, 
which is quite nice. Al although it's the cause of a ton of bugs because the the stuff like you can replace a field with true and it lets you do it. That's just like that. That's a a, a kind of side effect of this implicitly creating more nodes than you asked for. Oops. Uh, and so this basically means that we can get quite efficiently between two states of the syntax tree, but you can't do things like edit strings. Uh, that, that's not possible right now. And you can't save and load files, which is, you know, like for a, a project that's fairly young, I think this is a decent stage. And it's very stable as well, which is nice. Although, you know, it's written in Rust, so Rust basically forces you to be stable, otherwise it won't compile. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is an overview. I'm sure there's stuff I've forgotten, but I, I haven't really had a chance to um, sit down and just like work on Sapling for a load of time. I did it when it was it started, but I, I'm working on other projects as well, which take up my time. It's just the, <laughs> the the issues of of starting lots of projects is that some of them end up actually working and then you have to maintain them, which is uh, a bit of a you know I mean I, I guess it's a nice problem to have. Uh, and there are uh, back to the the tree sitter and other existing stuff. There are more different uh, well. Like syntax tree editors, basically. Um, there, there are more of them out there, but the, none of them try to be both. Gen like I, I think the only one that's tried to be general uh, has not been maintained for several years. So that was clearly didn't work. Work, and none of them try to be like Vim, which I think is like. Well, okay, it's not the most friendly, user-friendly thing in the world. But the thing is. The, the standpoint, the reason, uh, okay, slow down. The, where I got to Sapling is that I thought, okay, well, syntax, uh, writing code is, in, in my mind, it's like playing a musical instrument. You want to be as fast at it as possible. Not necessarily fast, but if you think of an idea, let's say, oh, I, I want to delete this function here uh, I want to be able to delete this function in as few keystrokes as possible because what I don't think about is uh, oh yes let's select these five lines and then delete them okay that's not really what I think about I think about this whole function should be removed uh, and this problem gets even worse right you can Let's say I was trying to add a function call around self as you size, uh, then I'd have to go, oh yeah, insert function, and then put the function call around. And Vim does better than most because what I when I did it there, I could do insert function, and then open bracket, and I can jump to the end of the line in two keystrokes. I can do escape and shift A to jump to the end of the line, but other text editors can't and the whole the whole point of sapling is to use to try and minimize the gap between your brain what you think about and what the editor thinks about uh, so in sapling let's say i wanted to insert something around that well i'd select this entire thing and then it'd have some kind of oh yeah insert as parent or like consume inwards or something like that there would be some way to in one command or in a few keystrokes to insert stuff in between whatever's the parent of this. Because the, the tree of this looks like function and an expression, which is the as clause. And they're, they're connected once. And what I really want to do is to insert a function in between them. So it's like the function definition steps above cursor, it goes down a step in between, and then to the as. Uh, yeah, so I would I would have something that would be say, insert parent would be a thing, and then you would put a function call around at that self as you size, and it would just snap. That would work, and it would do it. It would be one action, and you would think about the action to the code, and it would happen. 
uh, which uh, I, I'm not even sure. Like, this is a big experiment. I'm not even sure if this is going to work. But, you know, like, we don't know until we try. And if it does turn out to not work, well, it sapling can stand as a uh, as an example, right? It, it, it can be an example for other people who have the same ideas to go, ah, oh, yeah, well, this guy made a text editor like this, and it, it didn't work because of these design choices. And so hopefully other people in the future will go, oh, yeah, well, this did work and will follow its example, or it didn't work and will, like, follow its not example, right? It will go down a different path. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, like, at, at any rate, I think it's good enough, it's a good enough idea to be worth pursuing. I still not sure at all. Right, yeah. I don't want to be too pessimistic, right? But um, it's quite a big idea, and there's lots of there's lots of faffing around. Like, if you're coding something that you don't really know what it's going to do, uh, there's a lot of iteration and like rewriting features to write them in different ways that hopefully will make the editor better. Um, and just editing trees is in Rust is just. <laughs> <laughs> Rust does not lend itself nicely to any kind of graphs, put it that way. Uh, it's just a bit of a pain. You can get round it, but it's kind of like... It, that That's the only bit of Rust that I feel I'm fighting. Uh, but, but to be honest, I'd rather have Rust's memory safety than do this in C++, where, oh, everything's allowed, that's great, we can have a tree and we can like, modify it, and then if I do anything wrong at runtime, it will just seg fault with no information. So I, I'd much rather have to be more explicit about how pointers and stuff are going to work and not have to deal with random seg faults at runtime. Anyway, uh, I have run out of things to say. I, uh, are there any other things? I'm sure there was stuff that I was going to do. Oh, I was going to do the Photoshop thing, but that's like, I, I figure that's not what people are here for. I can do that and then upload it. Uh, so I think I might call it there, unless anyone has any other questions for stuff. Yes, a acyclic graphs are fine. And luckily the, the, the way Sapling stores nodes is the same way that Git stores, almost the same way that Git stores commits in file structure. So file structure is a tree, right? It's got directories and folders and uh, a linear uh, commit history is the same as the linear file, linear tree history of sapling. Um, it kind of works the same way. It stores a, a DAG of pointers between things in the tree. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to yeah, wave my hands around and get it to work. Um, yes, cyclic Cyclic graphs in Rust are a pain. Uh, my friend, so the friend whose ideas this comes from, he uh, tried to implement this in Rust and tried to implement stuff like that and it would just, it just got a nightmare. <laughs> so <laughs> Rust is not well designed. You can, you can do hacks. You can do what I've done to make life easier for us, which is to uh, implement a, an arena, which... Oh yeah, it just uses someone else's arena. But it, it's a place in memory where you can allocate stuff and importantly, they all get deallocated at the same time. Um, so you can just store the nodes and in Sapling's case, they're immutable, but you realistically could be able to mutate them. And then once you're finished with everything, then you drop the arena and all of the stuff internally goes as well. And th that's one, it's more efficient because you don't have to, you, you can do that with a few syscalls to the operating system to say, delete this, bam, uh, synchronizing item names. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is stuff that other projectional editors do. So uh, what Martin's talking about is, uh, I think what you're talking about anyway, is that in other editors like Dion and stuff that try to do syntax tree based stuff, they also use the fact that, uh, let's see, let's find an example. So I have node here. Okay. 
and node is a variable or at least it's not it's not a function call or something like that it refers to this parameter uh, and so if i were to change this say item node or something or node 2 then what dion and stuff will do is to realize oh yeah well that's just defined here and so we should edit them in sync so if you edit one it will update all of them and I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be possible, uh, except that it relies very heavily on the knowledge of the language and how the, not just the syntax of the language, it relies on the scoping rules of the language. Because uh, you can imagine something like uh, Emacs Lift, Lisp, for example, uh, why anyone would use a Vim style editor to edit Emacs config files, I have no idea, but th there are other languages like this where uh, the scoping rules are bizarre. Well, or they're, they're bizarre coming from languages that have scoping rules like this, where something defined in a parent will also be in scope in the child, the children of that thing. So the alloc function node defines node as a, a thing, and then all of the things underneath it are allowed to reference it. Uh, and what Dion does is it it stores the, the node names aren't strings they're pointers to the old string and it makes stuff like renaming uh, in rust you'd have to do uh rename i say node 2 uh, for example and I, that's only possible because i'm using uh, a language server in the background and it has realized oh yeah these two bits of text are the same oh good good that was the same so basically, I don't see how it should, why it shouldn't be done, but also I can see this being very fragile because you have to be very, very careful and it's very, very language specific about what are, um, actually, wait, no, I think it's, it's even more difficult than this. You could do it partially, but let's say I had a, do I have any... Do I have any public variables? Oh, public fields of structures. Uh, I think I do. Oh yeah, so let's say we have JSON null here, right? It, it, yeah, so it would be a fantastic feature, but I think it's largely... Oh, oh nice. I mean, it, it's nice to see, like, I, I'm not a proponent of the whole vim emacs war um i i use vim because vim was like i i met vim before meeting emacs and uh the the friend in question used vim way before me and i needed to edit some files over ssh and i knew that if i used vim i could ask him for advice right um so that's why that's kind of the only reason i use vim and it's kind of like too late to change um but yeah so that that would be that, that's interesting. I, I didn't think that was going to happen, but um, that's cool. Uh, uh, yeah. But but the, the issue, what I was saying before about uh, the renaming thing, is that let's say I renamed not. No. My internet connection is fine. Ah, right, we're back. Uh, okay, my my so my internet collapsed for a bit there, and I, I wasn't sure. Like the the playback playback on stream collapsed, and I couldn't tell whether it was my stream to you guys that collapsed or not. Um. Anyway, so that that was that explains the silence. Hello. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, oh, everyone arrives just to see mum, clearly. Um, okay, so I I'm got dinner soon, so I'll, I won't be streaming for much longer. But uh, one, one thing, I want to finish the, the train of thought about the why. Like, so I'm not, I, I'm not saying that it's not a good idea to implement the name synchronization, but it would be extremely hard. And 
I would say that it's probably better to add language server support and then leave it up to the language service to handle it. Um, because one of the issues that I don't think you could solve with Sapling is that, let's say I were to rename this to true2, okay? Um, this is in file AST test JSON. But if I look at other things, other files like editor DAG, and then go down to test, ooh, test, colon, you can see that this gets imported here in this line. And like, okay, well, that's okay. But the issue is that I'm pretty sure test JSON true is used here somewhere. Oh, I can't type. Okay, so it's used here. And if the if the names are synchronized, then they have to be synchronized across all of the instances, across all of the files. Uh, so let's say I rendered this to true too, then I would expect this to update as well. And this is what the language server does. If I rename, I can rename it to two, uh, two and it says, oh yeah, even more things reference this. So I need to load them for disk. Yes, that's okay. Um, change five buffers. Okay, so we, we had three uh, unedited files. Um, and we can see that true2 has changed. And uh, let's write all. And then <laughs> let's rename this back. Yeah, yeah, write all. And the, the thing is that, that the language server understands Rust and it understands that the only way this could be referenced is by other uh, other files in the source directory, right? Um, and the thing about that is that that's specific to Rust. If I was in Python, say, ignore the fact that Python has no kind of concept of statically, by, like, statically uh, importing stuff from other files, but you could have an arbitrary directory structure. Like, where do you, where do you stop looking for other files that you have to keep open all the time? Because, um, so... The issue is that in order to implement this successfully, have this work, you'd have to store, you'd have to open all of the other Rust files at the same time, parse them all, and just so that when we rename stuff, we can rename all of the instances correctly. Um, and then how do you, you need a way of telling the user, I mean, this is like implementation detail, but you need a way of telling the user, oh yeah, I, I changed five or like, let's say I'm working on a compiler, right? Like the Rust compiler is several million lines, like hundreds of files. Like this would get out of hand really, really quickly because uh, the compiler is an interlinked load of modules of crates. So, okay, you could split the crates up, uh, which is kind of a partial solution, right? Which is that you only store the crate that you're working on. Uh, but that could, that could still get huge. Uh, and then you'd have to store all of those. You'd have to parse them all as well. Uh, and then you'd probably want a language server for other things, like go to definition. Okay, go to definition is trivial if you can do that. If the names are synced, then go to definition is kind of easy. But there'd be a load of other things. Like you want type hints. So uh, like here, the language server's telling me that S is a string, stuff like that, that's nice to have. So you'd want the language server anyway. And nearly every self-respecting language server can do renaming. It's a bit janky, right? You have to call it and say, oh yeah, please do a rename. But I think it would just be a heck of a lot simpler, at least in the short term, to not have to deal with trying to figure out where these things are in in a language, a language not, uh, in an insensitive way, right? Like general, that's the word I'm looking for. You want to do this generally because I... Uh, yeah, there, there needs to be an API. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, I mean, okay, so we're going to have to plug in different languages as well, I expect. I don't think you could do it. I, I'd like to be able to work entirely from grammars, um, but I suspect that might not be possible. There'll be some pesky languages. Um, like, I think Rust is not context-free as well, which is a, a class of languages that are easy to make specifications for. Um and it's just like a tiny little bit of Rust source code. Like string literals, I think, are not context-free. And it means that you won't be able to write a... You, you won't be able to just have a grammar for them. 
there's some it has to be something more complicated i think i didn't quite follow the logic but enough people say it and i'm i'm willing to believe that at least might be true um yeah i can't remember what i was doing before <laughs> all of this but i think it's about dinner time so i'm going to head off now thank you all for coming hope you enjoyed it it's been cool hopefully see you guys next week with an updated uh with, with an updated youtube header uh, that will hopefully be there and i'll put the stream time as well in that header which is mainly why i want it because i don't think there's i don't think there's anywhere that says when the streams are so i think i'm gonna call it that bye